Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. This is the second video in a series of videos to accompany this book, and this video will deal with the contents of Chapter 2 on Argument Structure. Now, in the last video, I discussed a few general notions on the subject of construction grammar, and I presented something that I called the Grammar and Dictionary View of linguistic knowledge. Now, in that view, um, knowledge of language consists, at least in part, of a mental lexicon that contains all the words, their meanings and pronunciations, and on the other hand, a grammatical component that specifies how these words can be put together. Okay, so that's a very compartmentalized view of linguistic knowledge. Construction grammarians, uh, I explained, have abandoned this grammar and dictionary view in favor of a more integrated model, the so-called constructicon. So just to review, um, construction grammarians hold that everything that speakers know is a large inventory of constructions, the constructicon. I also explained that one of the main motivations for abandoning the grammar and dictionary model in favor of this constructicon view had to do with idiomatic expressions. Um, specifically, idiomatic expressions are all over the place, they occur everywhere in language, they are not just fixed strings that you could memorize, instead there are open slots in them, and idiomatic expressions are highly productive so that they allow you to create new uh, and creative patterns of usage. Right, um, so that was one of the main motivations that got construction grammar off the ground, yet uh, you may be surprised to learn that one of the foundational and most influential studies of construction grammar does not deal with these idioms or idiomatic constructions, but rather focuses on something you could call simple sentences, such as Pat gave Bill a book, or John threw the ball over the fence, Bob hammered the metal flat, that sort of thing. Now, in the last video, I discussed a couple of strategies that you can apply to find out whether something is a construction. Among these strategies, um, one was, does the string exhibit some kind of unusual syntax? Is there some non-predictable feature about the form going on? Is there some non-compositional meaning going on? Do, does the whole mean more than uh, could be expected given the meanings of the parts? Or are there some unusual constraints going on? Um, are there restrictions on how you can use the construction? Now, if you look at a sentence such as Pat gave Bill a book, none of these seem to apply. Okay, so Pat gave Bill a book. That's very ordinary syntax. Um, do we find non-compositional meaning? No, I don't think so. Um, if you know the meanings of give and of book, and you know the first names Pat and Bill, then um, Pat gave Bill a book that is completely compositional. Do we have constraints? Well, maybe we do, but it's hard to tell from this isolated example. Right, so surprising fun fact, uh, one of the central texts of construction grammar does not deal with idioms, but rather with simple sentences. Why is that? Let's find out. So, this video will be about argument structure, which in linguistics is also often called valency. And that's a term that linguists borrowed from chemistry. In chemistry, valency denotes the number of electrons that are swooshing around uh, in an atom like these ones here. So you see that there are some fairly simple atoms, such as hydrogen. And, um, well, as you go towards the right, things become more complex with carbon, nitrogen, and then oxygen. And you see that the numbers of electrons, they're a little different uh, in all of these atoms. Yeah, I don't know the first thing about chemistry, but um, I'm showing you this because atoms 
and their electrons are not at all unlike verbs and their participants. So if you take an English verb like yawn, that looks a lot like hydrogen in that the verb yawn takes exactly one participant, a subject. Yeah, You can have a sentence like the cat yawned and that's a fine sentence of English. Um, if you compare that to the verb send, send takes a larger set of participants. Well, it doesn't take, what do we have here, uh, eight electrons. No verb takes eight participants, uh, but send takes three. Yeah, um, John sent me a package. So um, send thus has a greater valency than yawn. That's the basic point. Now, um, how do we define valency? Um, the set of participants um, that occur with a verb, that's called the verb's valency. And you've probably come across the term in, um, well, you've come across transitive verbs, ditransitive verbs, intransitive verbs, that sort of forms part of ordinary school uh, education. So a verb like devour takes two participants. It has a valency of two. It is a transitive verb. Hand has a valency of three. That's a ditransitive verb. Uh, exist has a valency of one. Um, unicorns don't exist. So that's an intransitive verb. These participants um, are called the arguments of the verb. Now, arguments are typically discussed as nominal elements. Um, think of sent, John, sent, me, the package, John, me, and the package. Those are nominal groups. Uh, but arguments are not always endings, so it's useful to keep that in mind. Some verbs require other structures to co-occur with them. Think of the verb look. Yeah, He looked pale with an adjective. Um, a verb like come, we came to New York. Uh, I want to go, their want projects a to infinitive. He started singing a song, so start is a complement taking verb that can occur with an ing clause. And uh, something very similar going on with guess, guess can take that clause. I guess that John will pass the exam. So arguments are structures that um, are conventionally associated to co-occur with verbs and they can have different shapes. <clears throat> now, given the fact that sometimes you can leave stuff out and just use the verb like that, and sometimes you have to use it, it's useful to distinguish between um, optional arguments and obligatory arguments. Um, think of a verb such as eat. You can say something like the children ate. Um, so eat, it's usually thought of as a transitive verb that takes somebody who eats something that is eaten, as in the children ate cake. But the argument something that is eaten is optional. Sometimes speakers leave it out and say the children ate. Um, note that eat is relatively mm, tolerant in this regard, whereas a verb such as devour is less tolerant. So you can say the children devoured. Um, you have to say the children devoured something, yeah, the cake. So with devour, the argument something eaten is obligatory. And which arguments are optional or obligatory? That is a characteristic that is specific to individual verbs. On the other hand, there are elements that are always optional, and those are adjuncts. Yeah, so adjuncts are not arguments, they're not participants that are evoked by a verb, uh, but rather they are additions to a sentence uh, that can always be left out. If you consider these examples here, uh, the children ate the cake quickly. So quickly is nothing that is intrinsically evoked when you contemplate the verb eat. Or the ship sank near Cyprus. Okay, a ship has to sink somewhere if it wants to sink, uh, but near Cyprus, the location, is not necessarily part of the set of participants that sink um, 
evokes. John sang a song to embarrass his friends, okay, it's to embarrass his friends that gives a reason, uh, but this is not evoked by the verb sing by itself. So there you have it, those are adjuncts, optional elements that can be added to a sentence. <clears throat> I want to distinguish uh, between syntactic valency on the one hand and semantic valency on the other. So syntactic valency um, answers the question which participants of a verb have to be expressed and we've already seen with devour uh, a subject and an object they have to be expressed obligatorily. Um, with hand, a ditransitive object, uh, a subject, an indirect object, and a direct object, they have to be expressed obligatorily. John handed me the keys. Um, so it's not as easily possible to say John handed the keys with me somehow being implicit or John handed me with the something that he handed me being implicit. Um, things are not always that straightforward, so sometimes you have verbs like admit. Um, admit can occur with a subject and a direct object and um, optionally an oblique object. So you can say something like John admitted his mistake to Mary, but this to Mary is not obligatorily there. Right, that's syntactic valency, the set of syntactic structures that are projected by a verb that obligatorily or optionally occur with a verb. Contrast that with semantic valency. This answers the question, what participants are evoked by a verb? Um, so devour, if you think of an event of devouring, well, that evokes an eater, something that is eaten. That's it. Um, if you think of the verb hand, well, that evokes a giver, a taker, and something that is given. Uh, the verb admit evokes somebody who does the admitting, something that is admitted, and a listener. Okay, so this is uh, part of the semantics of admit. Notice that, um, well, the oblique object uh, that's corresponding to the listener is not always obligatorily expressed, but it is always evoked. So semantic valency, uh, that's also called the event structure of a verb. That's something conceptual, something to do with meaning rather than to do with form. Okay, um, so uh, speaking of semantic valency, um, there are generalizations that linguists have tried to make across the roles of participants that commonly occur with different verbs. So um, you may have heard of the term semantic roles or thematic roles. Those are notions such as agent, which is the initiator of an action, patient, the participant undergoing some kind of action or change of state, uh, a theme, the participant which is moving, an experiencer, the participant who is aware of some kind of stimulus, the stimulus then, of course, the participant that is experienced, beneficiary, the participant who benefits from an action, or recipient, the participant who receives an item. Right, so these roles you can think of as generalizations over roles that occur with different types of verbs. So <clears throat> if you have a verb like run, well, that has a runner. A runner is a kind of agent, an initiator of an action. Um, <clears throat> if you think of a verb like steal, uh, John stole um, my time yesterday. Uh, he asked me all sorts of questions. Well, there John was the initiator of an action. Um, but notice that with running and stealing, the actions are actually quite different. So these are generalizations. <clears throat> now, if we compare semantic and syntactic valency, it turns out that sometimes, and actually quite often, semantic valency is not the same as syntactic valency. Consider these examples here with the verb to sweep. Um, so 
think of a sweeping event and the kinds of participants that are evoked by sweeping. So if I do that, well, somebody who does the sweeping, um, some kind of surface that is swept, um, maybe some kind of instrument that the sweeping is done with, yeah? And if I am really in the mood, then I also think of some kind of dirt that is located uh, on the surface. Those are the participants. Um, the semantic valence, the event structure of sweep. Now, syntactically, sweep occurs in a range of different uh, contexts. So we can use it in a sentence like, we still have to sweep, yeah? Just the subject, nothing else. We still have to sweep the tiles. So there's the agent of the action and um, the tiles. You could think of that as some kind of patient that undergoes a change of state from being very dirty to cleanliness. We still have to sweep the tiles squeaky clean. We still have to sweep the mud off the tiles. Okay, so you see that syntactically sweep occurs with a very different set of structures here and also you see that uh, the different syntactic constructions highlight different sets of the participant set that sweep evokes semantically. So semantic valency does not always equal syntactic valency. Now the traditional idea of valency is that this is something that is in the lexicon, that is part of the mental lexicon, that is part of the information that is associated with each verb as it is listed in the mental lexicon. So, um, in your mind, in the kind of lexicon that you have, there is an entry for sweep, and that entry specifies the syntactic context with which the verb can occur. So, there's the general entry sweep, and then um, some specifications and say, okay, you can use this intransitively. John swept all day. Um, transitive. John swept the floor. Transitive plus some kind of resultant state adjective. Uh, John swept the floor shiny. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you could say that. Um, then transitive plus path. John swept the mud off the tiles. Something like that. Yeah, so the idea would be that sweep is represented in the mental lexicon with all of this information, a rich set of um, syntactic uh, context that sweep can take. This idea is very appealing, but it has problems. There are problems with lexically specified valency of this kind. And the main problem, again, is, well, Creativity. Uh, speakers use verbs creatively, that is, in syntactic contexts in which they have not heard a verb before. Um, okay, let's see some examples here. John played the piano to pieces. Um, this is not a context in which you would expect the verb play. Uh, he pulled himself free one leg at a time. No matter how carefully you lick a spoon clean, some goo will cling to it. That's wisdom right there. Um, so if it is the case that the lexicon specifies all there is to know about valency, finding such examples would mean that, okay, speakers have in their minds a lexical entry for play that specifies, okay, you can use play with an object in some kind of resultant state uh, prepositional phrase. Yeah? Um, it also, uh, there would have to be some kind of sub-entry under pull um, so that uh, the entry goes, okay, you have pull with an object and some resultant state adjective. Is that likely? Um, it seems that, well, at least for the person who has um, been saying this for the first time, uh, that is quite unlikely. Yeah? Um, also, note that the meanings of the verbs are somewhat different 
than the ordinary meanings of play and pull that you would learn or that, that you would represent in your mental dictionary. So the verb play, you can play an instrument, that means you engage in some way with a musical instrument so that uh, music emerges. Well, here in John played the piano to pieces, that is certainly an aspect, but there is more going on. Um, in particular, um, the entry would have to specify that play here means acting on an object in a violent manner that triggers a change of state in that object. Well, um, that sounds a little bit implausible and later in this video we will actually see that Adele Goldberg in her 1995 book argues against such implausible verb senses. Right. Um, <clears throat> there is, however, an alternative and much more attractive explanation for creative uses of this kind. Namely, that the syntactic context uh, in which you find a verb dictates a certain interpretation. So that, again, is the principle of coercion that I talked about in the last video. Just to remind you, if a lexical item is semantically incompatible with its morphosyntactic context, then the meaning of the lexical item conforms to the meaning of the structure in which it is embedded. So the context wins out. The context imposes some kind of meaning on the lexical item. So we can have our verb play, as it occurs in John plays the piano, and if we find it in a context such as John plays the piano to pieces, the constructional context here squishes the verb into a certain new interpretation, into a resultative interpretation in this case. Yeah, so that's coercion. And um, we see coercion at work um, in the examples that you see here. For instance, um, intransitive verbs such as run, sneeze, or worry, you see they ordinarily just occur with one participant, a uh, subject, yeah. John ran, the cat sneezed, uh, Bob's mother worried, and you have these resultative uses where there are, well, again, not, not eight participants, but, um, well, there's the subject, some kind of object, and then a resultant state description. John ran his feet sore, Fred sneezed his cat soaking wet, or Bob's mother worried herself sick. Right, um, so here you see coercion at work. Um, <clears throat> the resultative construction messing with the lexical meaning of run, sneeze, and worry. Um, perhaps even more dramatically, you see coercion at work in examples that use nonce verbs, uh, nonce words, so words that don't have any particular meaning. Here I created a sentence with words from uh, the Jabberwocky poem, yeah, um, the famous Jabberwocky poem. David has whiffled my borogoves completely vorpal again. Um, now, of course, you don't know what the words mean because they are not words in the traditional sense. But having read that David has whiffled my borogoves completely vorpal again, you do know that uh, David acted on the borogoves. Yeah, he whiffled them. And as a result of this whiffling, uh, the borogoves became vorpal. And that is quite remarkable. That's quite a feat. That's fairly sophisticated work that you're doing there. Um, how do you know that, given that all of these words don't even exist? Well, it's coercion at work. That uh, The constructional context imposes a certain meaning. Um, and uh, so that if the words mean anything, it doesn't play much of a role. Okay, um, this idea of coercion means that you can combine verbs and constructions and then the meanings of the two interact in some way. However, it has to be pointed out that you cannot insert any old verb into any kind of construction. There are restrictions on the possible combinations of verbs and constructions, even when um, the combinations would make sense um, from, from a general logic kind of perspective. So for instance, it would make sense 
to uh, say something like John heard his ears deaf with heavy metal. Yet you cannot say that. Uh, the grammar of English says no, that's not a sentence of the grammar of English. Uh, that's... Yeah, no. Um, John sank himself drowned. Semantically, that seems straightforward, uh, but really, no, that's not a sentence of English. How can you explain that John heard his ears deaf and John sank himself drowned are not proper sentences of English? Well, there's some explanation that has been invoked, namely the so-called semantic coherence principle. Um, so the, this principle states that both a verb and a construction have a set of semantic roles um, that they specify. And you can only put the two together if the sets of roles specified by the verb and by the construction, if they agree in some way. So only roles that are semantically compatible can be fused, can be put together. Um, two roles are compatible if one can be understood as an instance of another. All right, let me make this a little bit more explicit. Um, when can you combine a verb and a construction? Well, the easiest case for this would be uh, that a verb and a construction specify the exact same role. So for instance, the verb throw specifies an agent um, and a theme. So the agent is the thrower and the theme is the thing that gets thrown. And the caused motion construction um, specifies an agent, uh, a theme, and a path. And you see that agent and theme, that's um, present in both uh, the event structure of throw and in the event structure of the caused motion construction. So it's perfectly possible to um, use throw in the caused motion construction and say, John threw the potato across the room. Yeah. Um, now, things get a little more complicated when you have not the exact same set of roles in the construction and in the verb. Um, they have to be interpretable as an instance of one another. So, for instance, a theme you could say, is a kind of patient. A theme is the entity that undergoes some movement, and a movement, well, it could be interpreted as some kind of action that happens to you. If you're being thrown across the room, well, that is something that happens to you, and patients are all about stuff happening to you. <clears throat> right, so uh, let's take a concrete example here, the verb tickle specifies an agent and a patient, uh, Mary tickled John. And the cause motion construction specifies an agent, so that's a good correspondence there with tickle, and a theme. Um, so if you want to use tickle in the cause motion construction, the theme and the patient, they would have to be fused. And uh, a theme being a kind of patient, this actually works. So you can say things like Mary tickled John out of the bed yeah, um, so this means that Mary tickled John, and as a result, John moved out of the bed. So that's how you can explain whether or not you can combine a verb and a construction. Um, why does all of this matter to construction grammar? Now, um, in the last video, I said that what construction grammarians are concerned with, that's the kinds of things that speakers know when they know a language. Now, argument structure constructions, like the cause motion construction, they form part of speakers' knowledge of language, and they allow speakers to create unconventional pairings of verbs with syntactic context. So they allow you to create utterances that are formally idiosyncratic, and they allow you to uh, form utterances that have non compositional meaning. So, Mary tickled John out of the bed. There is something non-compositional going on there, namely that the tickling was the cause of John moving out of the bed. Yeah, so, um, this then is uh, 
uh, Goldberg's 95 book that started a lot of current construction grammar research. Uh, what she analyzes in this book are sentence patterns that involve a verb and several nominal structures. Um, and the idea, that groundbreaking idea of, uh, of this book, is that these patterns have meaning. Okay, So they're not just blueprints for putting together words into larger phrasal units. No, rather... Um, Constructions like the cause motion construction or the ditransitive construction, they have meaning. They are endowed with meaning of their own. And so you can say things like David whiffled, the borrow goes completely vorpal, and you get some meaning out of it, even though the words themselves don't have any meaning. Right. Um, what kinds of meaning do they have? Um, what's the meaning of the ditransitive or of the cause motion construction? Well, the meanings of these simple sentences that Goldberg deals with reflect very basic recurrent types of everyday experience. And she actually has a story about this, namely um, a hypothesis that she calls the scene encoding hypothesis. And uh, what it states is that constructions which correspond to basic sentence types, to simple sentences, these constructions encode as their central senses event types that are basic to human experience. So things that you experience very often or do very often, those get encoded in these simple sentences. Um, let me give you a few examples here. So here are a few things that happen fairly often. Um, acts of giving. No matter at what time of day you're watching this video, I bet you that you will have experienced at least one or two acts of giving and taking uh, today. Um, moving, yeah, self-propelled motion, that is, uh, or self-initiated action, that is something that we experience all the time. And so, likely, there would be a construction for it, some kind of conventional way of expressing it. Changing an object uh, in terms of that it looks differently afterwards, that it undergoes some kind of change of state, you act on it, it disintegrates like this pineapple here, something like that. Um, placing an object somewhere, um, that is something that we do all the time. Or acting involuntarily, yeah, uh, that would be another frequent thing happening to us. Um, now the grammar of English uh, tends to group together uh, acts of moving and acts of uh, acting involuntarily. It's both John ran and John sneezed. But you do find lots and lots of languages who encode these events differently. I have one particular way of referring to self-initiated acts and one different way of referring to uh, involuntary acts. Yeah. Right. Okay, so those would be candidates of semantic frames that would then be expressed in uh, argument structure constructions. <clears throat> there are two main types of argument structure constructions that I want to treat in this video. One uh, that you've already seen are so-called valency increasing constructions like the um, cause motion construction. So the cause motion construction takes a verb such as sneeze, which is intransitive, as just one participant, and blows up the valency of that verb into something bigger. Uh, so we get examples such as John sneezed the napkin off the table. That's one type. And that's the most well-researched type of um, construction uh, as far as argument structure constructions are concerned. But there are also valency decreasing construction. That's the, the mirror image of this. Um, so think of a verb like make that is transitive. Uh, John made a mistake. Um, you can actually have a construction that decreases that valency of make and turns it into something like mistakes were made yeah, with just the subject and no um, the, the maker of the mistake is suppressed there. Right. Um, let me say a few things about valency increasing constructions and the paradigm case here that I want to discuss is the ditransitive construction. The ditransitive construction has 
a very simple structure. It consists of a verb, a subject, a verb, a first object, and a second object. And um, okay, we can do this here. We can do this here. Um, I would like you to pause the video for a second and uh, come up with a sentence that matches this structure. Yeah, uh, subject, a verb, object one, object two. Now's your chance. Okay, I'm going to continue. Um, if you do this with a class of 25 or so students, roughly half of them will generate a sentence with the verb give, and you did probably too. Um, you probably know the ditransitive construction, but never mind. Uh, you can do this with a set of uh, naive subjects, and that will give you some more trustworthy results. Right, um, so the central sense of this construction corresponds to this predominance of give. Uh, namely, um, what this construction centrally encodes is a transfer of an object between a volitional agent and a willing recipient, as in John gave Mary a book. So, um, John <clears throat> intentionally handed over the book and Mary willingly accepted it. <clears throat> There are several other senses associated with the construction. Um, for instance, if you take examples such as John denied Mary a cookie or John bequeathed Mary a gold watch, uh, the first is not about a transfer, it's about the um, opposite of a transfer, yeah? a blocked transfer. John bequeathed Mary a gold watch, well, that is some kind of transfer, but um, well, it's more a transfer that lies in the future. And then there are several metaphorical meaning extensions. So John gave Mary a kiss. Well, um, that's not really a transfer of an object. Yeah, a kiss is something more immaterial. Or John gave Mary an idea. If John gave Mary an idea, John still has that idea at the end of the process. Um, although that would be funny if you give someone an idea and you forget what you actually thought of. Right, so that's the semantics of the ditransitive construction. And um, Goldberg models this as a network of senses with the central sense in the middle, successful transfer of some kind of object from a giver to a recipient. And then the other senses like enabled transfer, she permitted Billy one candy bar, um, or blocked transfer, Harry refused Bob a raise, so those you have at the fringes of the constructional network. Yeah, the ditransitive. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is that some verbs cannot be used in the ditransitive despite having a meaning that you might think would fit quite well. So you can't say things like Sally whispered him the news, uh, Sally enabled Bob a kiss, yeah. Um, Sally explained Bob the theory uh, Sally communicated Bob the information, or Sally donated the Red Cross a uh, hundred dollars. You can't say that. Why? Yeah. So those are idiosyncratic constraints of the kind that I talked about in the last video, and there are explanations for these restrictions. Um, I don't have time to go into them now, though. Um, so why should we assume that a pattern like the ditransitive is a construction? Here's again the definition that Goldberg 95 presents. Uh, so something is a construction if it's a form-meaning pair, uh, so that some aspect of the form or some aspect of the meaning is not strictly predictable from the component parts or from other constructions that exist in the language. Okay, so here we're using this uh, strict definition with non-predictability criterion. Um, if we have a sentence such as John baked Mary a cake, is there something non-predictable um, going on? Does the sentence convey something more than is conveyed by the meanings of the respective parts? It turns out, yes, there is. Um, if I say that John baked Mary a cake, what I express is that John uh, baked a cake with the express purpose of giving it to Mary. 
Okay, John had all the intentions to give it to Mary, but crucially, it's not necessarily the case that Mary ended up getting the cake. So if John baked Mary the cake and then went to Mary's house and there he was um, mugged and the, the thieves took the cake, uh, well, he still would have baked Mary a cake, just that uh, the cake never arrived at Mary's house. This is not predictable from the individual word meanings of bake, cake, John and Mary. Right, so on these grounds, there are reasons for calling the detransitive a construction. Um, also, Goldberg points out, we're coming back to this idea of implausible verb senses, that with John baked Mary a cake, um, you could perhaps save the compositionality idea by saying that, well, bake in this sense has a very special meaning that is listed in your mental lexicon, namely, bake has the secondary meaning of uh, intent to cause someone else to receive the product of applying hot air to an edible substance. Yeah, um, I'm ridiculing this idea a little bit, but not much. Yeah, something of this kind would have to be in your mental lexicon for this to be a compositional, uh, semantically transparent sentence. Likewise, if you have a caused motion example, such as John sneezed the napkin off the table, um, well, if you wanted this to be compositional, then sneeze would have the meaning move something by means of exhaling in a burst from the nose. Yeah, stranger things have happened, but um, is it likely? No. It's implausible. Or John talked himself blue in the face. Well, here talk would have to mean cause someone to become something by means of uttering words. Well, you can decide for yourself whether you think that is plausible or implausible. However, um, there is some kind of simplicity in saying, well, in these cases, bake just means bake, sneeze just means sneeze, talk just means talk, and the additional meaning is contributed by the syntactic construction. Um, this is visualized here in this graph. You posit constructional meaning instead of these ad hoc verb senses in that bake just means bake, yeah? And the ditransitive construction uh, adds the meaning of an intentional transfer. So that in John bake Mary a cake, the bake verb just means bake, but uh, the syntactic frame contributes additional meanings that lead to the overall meaning of John bake Mary a cake. Okay, um, a few more things on the semantics of the construction. I already pointed out that the agent needs to be volitional. Uh, the agent needs to carry out the transfer willingly and this is certainly the case in uh, John kicked Mary the soccer ball, John threw the squirrel some peanuts or John painted Mary a picture. Um, John is doing all these things on purpose. However, there are some examples that are a little troublesome in this department, namely uh, a perfectly ordinary sentence, John gave me the flu. Well, did he do that on purpose? Um, is John some kind of malicious person that walks around sneezing at people and then... No, probably not. Probably that's nothing that we understand from John gave me the flu. Or even worse, perhaps the medicine brought me relief. Um, some kind of pill that's a chemical substance. It's nothing that has um, intentions or volition or a theory of mind or anything like that. Right, so what do we do with that? How do we explain that? Well, Goldberg explained this, this through metaphor. Namely, that transfers are uh, <clears throat> something that can be metaphorically uh, linked to causes, situations of cause and effect. Situations of cause and effect are cognitively challenging. They're difficult to understand. Um, human beings see causal events everywhere. Um, and, um, well, situations of cause and effect you can construe as situations in which the cause brings some kind of effect to a recipient. Um, consider these examples here. The report furnished them with all the information they needed. So um, something brings the information to you. Uh, 
This is a situation of cause and effect, really. As a result of the report, you become more informed. Uh, the new legislation brought new controversies. The accident presented us with a large number of injured workers. Nothing good ever came from smoking. So causation is talked about in terms of bringing stuff. Yeah. So that's the basis for saying here there's a metaphor going on. <clears throat> Another thing about the detransitive is that the recipient needs to be willing. Uh, the recipient needs to accept the transfer consciously and uh, willingly. And this is the case in John kicked Mary the soccer ball or John threw the squirrel some peanuts. So what these sentences evoke is that, that Mary was running ahead and uh, looking towards John and wanting to you know, get the ball. And also the squirrels, they were running around the park and uh, trying to get as many peanuts as John would throw at them. They were not lying there half dead, uh, waiting for somebody to throw peanuts at them. <clears throat> so the willingness of the recipient becomes evident in the un acceptability of some sentences like uh, John burned Mary some rice or John threw the unconscious patient a blanket. They don't work because in these cases the recipient either does not want to accept uh, the transfer, nobody likes burnt rice, uh, or somebody who's unconscious is unfortunately deprived of the possibility of accepting a transfer willingly. Again, as you might have expected, there are some troublesome examples. So when, um, again, John gave me the flu, yeah, um, was I asking for this? Maybe I had an important exam that I didn't want to take and said, John, please give me the flu. Um, no, probably not. Um, the Tabasco sauce gave the dish a spicy flavor. Well, you know, the dish is really not in a position to be willing or unwilling. Uh, and again, the explanation is the causes are transfers metaphor here. There are even further metaphorical extensions um, in examples such as John told Mary a joke. Here, the transferred object is some kind of information, um, not a concrete object. And uh, I already mentioned that here the transfer works a little differently because Mm, well, after John told Mary a joke, he still has access to that joke. He still remembers the joke. Um, directed actions, that's another thing. John gave Mary a wink or Mary gave John a kick. Um, these you can explain through recourse to metaphor. Um, some more examples that have the ditransitive form but that differ subtly in meaning. I'll give you that assumption. Uh, I'll grant you that much of your argument. Or uh, John offered Mary a ride to the airport. John owes me many favors. Beneficial actions are thought of as transferred objects. Right. Um, so much for the ditransitive and for valency increase in constructions. I want to say a few things to close uh, this video on the subject of valency decreasing constructions and here the passive is one obvious candidate to discuss. So usually the passive is thought of as the um, not so famous brother of the active construction. Um, so there's a correspondence between the active which is the unmarked case and the passive which is the marked case. So a sentence such as the reviewer rejected the paper is the active counterpart to the paper was rejected by the reviewer. Or John paid the bill, that's the active counterpart um, for the bill was paid by John. So in these correspondences, uh, the active subject appears in the passive as a biphrase, the active object appears as the passive subject, and the active verb occurs with an auxiliary in the passive, either the um, auxiliary be or uh, you can also use get in the so-called get passive. Now, <clears throat> a question that you could ask is, um, well, do we 
need to posit a construction here, couldn't the passive be derived from the active by a simple grammatical rule? In other words, could this be something very simple that is located in the grammatical component of the dictionary and grammar model of linguistic knowledge? And as a construction grammarian, you would have to answer, well, my reasons for saying we need to call this a construction are the following. Here are some pieces of evidence. Uh, there are problematic cases. Um, so here's an active sentence. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can say something like John was given a large data set for the analysis, but you cannot say a large data set was given John for the analysis. So um, John can be the subject of a passive sentence here, but a large data set um, cannot be. Right. Um, then there are examples such as uh, Sally's papers are referred to a lot. That is something you can say. Um, but uh, other sentences that look structurally very similar uh, for some reason do not work. The children are looked to a lot. That for some reason does not work. So uh, this might be a first indication that there are idiosyncratic constraints that are specific to the passive that necessitate um, some kind of constructional knowledge here. Um, further problematic cases. Um, <clears throat> so it's okay to say the plan was approved of by my mother, everything was paid for in advance, or these issues will be dealt with in another paper. So passives with prepositional verbs, uh, approve of something, pay for something, deal with something. Um, yeah, uh, there are some cases that do not quite work as well. So the bed was thoroughly searched under with some persuasion. I would say, yeah, that's okay. Uh, this hallway was walked across by George Washington. Uh, it's getting silly. Uh, these two theories have been chosen between... No, uh, no. Nah, nah. um, what works is uh, texting a marriage proposal is not recommended. Um, so with recommend, um, that's fine to pacifize. But uh, texting a marriage proposal was remembered by John is decidedly odd. So again, there seem to be idiosyncratic constraints at work. And um, more importantly, there are a number of passives without active counterparts. So you can say something like John is reputed to be very rich. Uh, that has is a sentence in the form of a passive. But you can say many people repute John to be very rich. So there's no active counterpart. Uh, Kim is said to be a manic depressive. Um, many say Kim to be manic depressive. That is not quite there. It's, um, yeah, so it's problematic. It is rumored that there will be an election before the end of the year. Many people rumor that there will be an election before the end of the year. Borderline possible, but still, uh, I think it's clear that the passive formulation is much more conventional, much more idiomatic than any corresponding active sentence. So the bottom line here would be that the passive too is a construction that has a meaning in its own right. It's not just a marked counterpart to the active that you could derive with some kind of meaningless syntactic rule. Okay. That's what I wanted to say about valency increasing constructions, valency decreasing constructions. I'll finish with a very brief preview of chapter three. In the next video, we will talk about the constructicon. Um, so the construction grammar idea of what knowledge of language is like. Uh, it's a large inventory of constructions. And uh, something that you might ask yourself is, well, how is that inventory internally structured? Is it a big bag of uh, constructions, a big box? <clears throat> like, for instance, say a box of Lego blocks where everything is jumbled together? Or is, it, uh, is there some internal structure to it? Is it maybe more like a library where the constructions are ordered um, 
according to specific criteria? Or is it something like a hypertext, something like the Wikipedia? Um, well, we'll talk about this in the next video and I hope you will find it online sometime soon.